Good morning. Happy fourth to you. A little bit early. Uh, but let's all stand together as we sing America the Beautiful. Oh, beautiful, for oh, spacious skies, for amber waves of grain, for oh, purple mountain majesty, above the fruit you play. Shining sea, oh beautiful, for heroes too, in liberating strife, who mold himself, their country, and mercy. thank you for this nation that we live in. We thank you that you have blessed us over the years. We pray that you would bless us again. But we know that takes us turning back to you. And we pray that we as a nation would hear your call, would be sensitive to your word, would be obedient to your spirit. And Father, we pray that we would come running back to you. We pray these things in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. There we go. All right, let's start off by reading today's scripture. It's going to be Hebrews 11.6. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is rewarder for those who diligently seek him. Don't forget, we do have Bible classes via Zoom conferencing on Sunday mornings at 9.30 a.m. and Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. On Wednesdays, we'll be studying the book of Revelation. Uh, you can access those on the email link or on the church website. Uh, if you have any prayer requests, you can forward them over to ministryadmin at gbcmd.com. And when God's offering, we do have an offertory box up here, or you can give on the church, the church website. Uh, you can follow along with the message by downloading the Version Bible app. Bible app. Just click on the three lines on the bottom right-hand corner, click on events, and look for Germantown Baptist Church. In addition, all the lyrics will be on there as well. Uh, VBS will be on July 25th through the 29th from 6 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. Uh, we do need volunteers as well as donations for supplies. Uh, if you, uh, you can see Kimberly, off, Kimberly Walker for more information. And this should be. Mm -hmm. 
When the night seems to say All hope is lost, gone away But I know I'm not alone by the light she stands, and there she waits, faithful friend, shimmering stars westward wind. Show the way, carry me to the place she stands. Just when you think it might be over, just when you think the fight is gone. Someone will risk his life to raise her And there she stands And there she flies Clear blue sky Reminds with red those who die Washed in white By the brave And in the strength She stands When evil calls itself a martyr When Let's all stand as we come together to sing praises to the King. My beloved. There's a sun coming up in my soul, Lord, in my soul. There's a sun coming up in my soul, Lord, in my soul. I see the light. I see the light. I see the light.
Take me up to your resurrection place My beloved, bring me away Cause I wanna feel your light on my face There's a song coming up There's a sun coming up in my soul, Lord, in my soul. I see the light, I see the light. I see the light, I see the light. Oh, thank you, God, I see the light. Jordan, up out of this place, my beloved, for you I wait, with you here to forever place to pray. There's a sun coming up in my soul, Lord, in my soul. There's a sun coming up. day to fly away today, huh?
This uh, next song is called Awake My Soul. And uh, Ezekiel is taken out to a former battlefield where there are dry bones from this battle. Just bones. And he's called to prophesy to them. A nation that basically was no more. And God would give them new life and breathe his spirit into them. That's kind of where we are in America today. We are dry bones, amen? And we need the Spirit of God to awake our souls. Breathe on me, breath of God, breathe on me.
You're the Lord of all creation And still you know my heart The author of salvation You love us from the start Waiting here for you with our hands lifted high in the day, and it's you we adore. Faithfulness is true. We're desperate for the presence. All we need is you. Waiting here for you. With our hands lifted. And it's you we adore singing. Father, your word reminds us time and time again to wait upon the Lord. And Father, we do that today, knowing that your promises are true. Your word is everlasting. What you said will come to pass. And Father, we just wait for your timing. And in that waiting, we trust. We trust who you are, what you said. Father, we do pause for a moment to lift this nation up to you. A nation that was once founded upon your truth. 
was once created to establish freedom for all of its citizens. Father, we pray that our dependency upon you would be reestablished. We pray that your church would be awakened. We pray that our eyes would be open and we would be sensitive to how you're moving in this world, what you're doing. And Father, may we seek to be part of that. We praise you for your goodness. We praise you for your word that we will open. And may you speak to each heart here. And Father, just as the disciples asked, Lord, teach us to pray. Let us know how to have fellowship and communion with you. We pray these things in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. Might need that. It's a good thing when you leave your Bible on your desk after Sunday school, isn't it? All right. Uh, Matthew chapter 6. And we're still looking at uh, the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, we've been doing that for quite a few months now. Uh, in chapter 6, beginning down in verse 9, however, we're looking even more specifically at prayer. Uh, what we call, some people call the Lord's Prayer. Uh, the Lord's Prayer, in fact, is actually found in John 17, where he prays to the Father directly and the disciples hear that. That's the Lord's Prayer. The model prayer is in response to, to the disciples basically saying, Lord, we see you praying day after day. We see you connecting with the Father. We see this life, this love that you have that is part of your prayer life, and we want that. And so they, they ask, Lord, teach us. To pray. And so in chapter 6, beginning in verse 9, he does exactly that. Now, last week we looked at the very first part of this and that one little phrase, our Father. And um, that one phrase shows something dynamic that had never taken place in the Old Testament. Uh, it was nothing, it was something that was, was never realized until Jesus said, you can call God your Father. And the reason is because now because Jesus has come, He has made it possible for us to become adopted. We become joint heirs with Him. If you are in Christ, you are a joint heir with Him. Now remember, last week we were talking about when man fell, we took on the image of the serpent, we became more like the serpent than the image of our Heavenly Father. And that was backed up when Jesus was talking to the Pharisees. He said to the Pharisees, you are of your father, the devil. Well, that's how we all were after the fall. And so now Jesus has come to reverse that, and he's given us this awesome privilege to know God once again as Father. And so when we pray and when you address God as Father, don't forget 
that that is a beautiful, wonderful thing that you have. You are an adopted child of God. And we read Romans 8, verse 15. It says, For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. That's where you came from. But you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies together with our spirit that we are God's children. And if children also heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, seeing that we suffer with him so that we also may be glorified with him. You see, it wasn't enough just for God to forgive our sins, cancel our debt through the cross. He wanted to give us more. He wanted to make us his children once again. Only made possible through Jesus' sacrifice and his replacement. And he wanted to give us a share in the inheritance of the Son. I don't know if you remember last week we said that our old father, the devil, you remember what his inheritance was? Jesus says, the inheritance of the devil and his angels is the eternal lake of fire. Well, our old father wanted to give us that inheritance. How nice of him. But God said, I want to give you a new inheritance. Eternity with him. What a great trade. Amen? So this morning we're... We're going to venture forth a little bit further in the model prayer. And we're going to look at the next couple of words. There's one word that we see in verse 9 that is very little, but it just might be one of the most important words in this prayer. Look at Matthew 6, verse 9. It says, In this manner, therefore pray. This is how you pray. Again, this is not the what that you pray. Jesus never meant for this to be just a vain repetition, a recitation. It wasn't just to be memorized and then blurted out without any thought or process. This is Jesus saying, this is how you pray. It's not the what that you pray. This is an outline. It's a template for you to use. So he says, our Father, that's what we looked at last week, so last, last week, you got as far as two words. We're going, to get, we're going to double that this week. We're going to do two more words in the model prayer. I know we are jamming. Our Father, and then the next two words is, who is? Who is? This one little word that is really important is the word is. Is. Sometimes the most important things in life are actually the smallest things in life. There's an old proverb, an old poem that said, For the want of a nail, the shoe was lost. For the want of the shoe, a horse was lost. For the want of a horse, the rider was lost. For the want of a rider, the battle was lost. And for the want of a battle, the kingdom was lost and all for the want of a horseshoe nail, something small. I think all of us realize that sometimes it is the small things that are very important in life. What good is your computer if you take out the microchip? It's a big, big weight is what it is, especially if you have an older one. If you're going into an airplane, if anybody flying soon, anybody going on a trip soon? When you, when you go out and you see your jet, you do kind of look at it to make sure that it's kind of airworthy, right? Could you imagine going out to your jet, and as you're going out, you see, you know, that, that mount that mounts the engine to the wing? You see that a bolt on that mount just fell out on the tarmac. Just a little bolt. Just a little bolt. <laughs> Do you still want to get on that plane? Well, not so much anymore. What if you get into your car and you notice that the brake caliper bolts have fallen out? Who needs brakes? <laughs> Just small bolts. 
So small things do matter, correct? And then this first sentence of the model prayer, the small word is, is huge. And the reason is, in order for us to even begin to pray, you have to believe that God is. Now, I think all of us have had those moments in our life where our prayer life was wanting. It seems like our prayer life might have even been empty. We pray sometimes and it feels like we're just praying into a dark void. We pray sometimes even out loud and it seems that the prayers only go as far as the voice will carry. And I think the problem that arises when we feel that is because we're missing the most important part, part of prayer. God is. God is. We don't pray to a God who was. We don't pray to a God who used to be. We don't even pray to a God who is a has-been. We pray to a God who is. A God who is in heaven. A God who is on the throne. And what Jesus even said, a God who is our Father. Now, you've probably heard Hebrews 11, verse 6, numerous times if you've gone to church for any period of time. And usually we kind of focus on the first part of this, but without faith it is impossible to please Him. And so we look at the definition of faith and understanding of faith and, and God's desire for us to use faith. But go on a little bit further. Without faith it is impossible to please Him for... He who comes to God must believe, what? That He is. Isn't that what Jesus just said? Our Father who is. You must believe that He is and that He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. You see, if you believe that God is, then you will diligently seek after Him. If you don't really believe that God is, then you're probably not going to pursue Him at all. If there's no confidence that He is, then there's no diligence in seeking Him. Now, I have a picture up on the overheads, and if you're at home, you can look at uh, those on the uh, Uversion Bible events part of that app. And... Um, it's a picture of a man looking in his yard with a shovel. And the reason I put that picture on there is how many of you believe right now that there is a buried treasure in your backyard? Anybody? You believe there is a buried treasure in your backyard? Now, since you probably don't believe that there is a buried treasure in your backyard, then you're probably not going to go rent a backhoe. You're not going to break out the shovel and you're not going to dig up your whole backyard looking for something that you don't believe to be there. If you did that, you might have some problems. But let's say somebody reputable came across a treasure map, treasured jewels. If you heard that, now would you... And when you do, you will diligently seek him, just as one would a treasure. Now, this reminds me, of a conversation between God and Moses. And we go through the Exodus period, and there's a lot of conversations between God and Moses, right? But this is when God first calls Moses. And the very first thing that Moses had to realize in this calling was that God is. Isn't that right? 
We just read that in Hebrews 11.6. Without faith, it's impossible to please God because you must believe that He is. In order for Moses to be obedient to the Word of God, he has to believe that God is. And so Moses has this huge reality check in the wilderness of Sinai. And he has this conversation with God, and then Moses says, Whom shall I say has sent me? What is your name? God's reply, we all know this, I am. I am. Which is the Hebrew perpetual form of the verb to be. He didn't say, I was or will be, but the I am. Perpetually, I am. There is no past tense. There is no present tense. There is no future tense to God. He is perpetual tense. So he is the I am yesterday. He is the I am today. He is the I am tomorrow. And so something happened when Moses realized that God is the I am. Suddenly, Moses realized who he was. Moses was the I am not. And every single one of us, we have to come to that realization. When you realize that God is, then there's a sudden realization that you are not. You are not God. You are not sovereign. And I hate to shatter and burst your bubble, but the universe does not revolve around you. It's a realization that God is. Now, as we proceed through this conversation between God and Moses, we, we notice that God simply called Moses. Moses, I want you to go back to Pharaoh. Have him let my people go. Plain and simple, right? Was there an interview process? Did God sit down with Moses and say, pull up a chair, I need to interview you for this job to see if you're, you know, qualified. Moses, tell me your experience. Give me your referrals. What kind of credentials do you have? What's your education level? I see you have 40 years experience in Pharaoh's house. That's going to come in handy. I see that you have 40 years out here in the wilderness with all these sheep, and you know every piece of land in this region. That's going to come in handy as well. But do you know that God was not interested in what Moses had to offer? Because Israel would not be delivered by the hand of Moses. Israel would be delivered by the hand of God. Now, God wasn't concerned with what Moses had to offer, but Moses was concerned with what Moses had to offer. That's, that's us, right? When God calls you, all of a sudden you start looking, ah, oh, what are my qualifications in doing this? How am I equipped to do what God has called me to do? And again, we become concerned with what we have to offer God. And again, God doesn't care what you have to offer. It's not your ability. And so since Moses was concerned with his own qualifications, Moses comes up with five excuses. And these excuses are based upon Moses' ability, not God's ability. And so these five excuses, you might be familiar with them. Number one, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? Number two, who shall I say has sent me? Number three, suppose they do not believe me or listen to my voice. Number four, I am slow in speech and slow of tongue. I find that one to be a pathetic excuse. Because when you go through the rest of the Exodus, you know, Aaron was supposed to be Moses' mouthpiece, right? Who does all the talking? Aaron's just like this. The whole time, quiet. And Moses is the one who speaks. Bad excuse. And the fifth one was just simply this. I don't want to go. I don't want to go. 
Now, every single one of these excuses are Moses-centered. In the same way, every excuse you come up with when God calls you will be you-centered. You'll be looking at your own qualifications and abilities. But when you're trusting in God and His abilities, guess what? There are no excuses at all. In fact, these five excuses that Moses gave, God has an excuse buster for every single one of them. Again, Moses says, Whom am I, whom, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? God responds by saying, It's not who you are, Moses, it's who I am. And the second one, Who shall I say has sent, has sent me? God says, I am. I am whatever is needed. Thirdly, suppose they do not believe me or listen to my voice, and God responds, I will be with you. Fourthly, I am slow in speech and slow of tongue. God says, I'll give you another voice, your brother Aaron. And fifthly, I don't want to go. Send someone else. God says, I will teach you what to do. So let me ask you, what excuse have you come up with to get out of God's calling? I've been in the ministry now for 36 years, so I'm 37. <laughs> 36 years, and I've lived in Vegas, which is a very worldly city, right? I lived in Germantown, just outside of D.C., which is a very worldly city. And over the 36 years, I've heard many, many excuses from people. And some of them are pretty good. Some people come up with really good excuses, very creative. But I probably should write a book on the excuses that people make. And I've come up with a bunch of my own, so I'm kind of an expert in the field. But could you imagine if we use you know, take those excuses that we normally use for church. We know all those excuses. I don't, I don't want to go to church because, and the excuse. Could you imagine if you use those, those excuses on something other than church? Something that you normally do without excuses. How many of you ever come up with an excuse that you don't want to eat? Anybody? Now, could you imagine, just bear with me, I know this is, Chasing rabbits. Could you imagine using the same excuses that you use to not go to church and put them in not wanting to eat? So I came up with 10. Number 10, I was forced to eat as a child. Number nine, people who eat all the time are hypocrites. They're not really hungry. Number eight, there are, are so many different kinds of food, I can't decide what to eat. Number seven, I used to eat but I got bored and stopped. Number six, I only eat on special occasions like at Christmas and Easter. Number five, none of my friends will eat with me. Number four, I'll start eating when I get older. Number three, I really don't have any time to eat at all. Number two, I don't believe that eating does anybody any good. It's all just a crutch. And number one, Restaurants and grocery stores, they're only after your money. It's funny how we come up with so many excuses for church. But we don't use the same excuses for those things that we want to do. And it's amazing that you and I come, come up with these excuses. And we might impress other people. But could you imagine trying to give an excuse to a God who knows your very thoughts. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Ask Moses. So, honestly speaking, if someone were to ask you, do you believe God's word to be true? How would you respond? Yes, I believe God's word to be true. Do you believe all of it? Well, the parts that I like. 
Uh, we hear Philippians 4.13 all the time. We, we see it in sports. People put it, you know, as, as uh, um, eye black uh, on them, tattoo it on them, hold signs up. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. We love quoting that, don't we? The idea in this text is I can do all things through Christ in any situation and I can find contentment because I know that he's in charge and he will meet every need that I have. You don't take this verse and basically say, I can dunk a basketball like Michael Jordan because I'm quoting Philippians 4.13. I can do all things. No, you can't. But there is this, this, this uh, thought. I don't know who originally came up with it, but I like the thought. It says, a basketball in my hands is worth about $80. A basketball in Michael Jordan's hands probably worth about $30 million plus. It all depends on whose hand it's in. A baseball in my hand is worth about $25. A baseball in Mike Trout's hand is probably worth about $30 million. It depends on whose hands it's in. A tennis racket in my hand is pretty useless. A tennis racket in Serena Williams' hands, well, it might win a Wimbledon, maybe not this year, but other years. It depends on whose hands it's in. Two fish, five loaves of bread in my hands is a couple of fish sandwiches. But in the hands of Jesus, it can feed thousands. It depends on whose hands it's in. And then the last one goes like this. Nails in my hands might produce a birdhouse, but nails in the hands of Jesus will produce salvation for the entire world. It depends whose hands it's in. Again, we're not looking at our ability. We're looking at the ability of the one who calls us. How many of you have ever filled out an application for employment? Pretty much all of us, right? Your potential employer, they want to know everything about you. They want to know your personal information. They want to know your education level, your work experience, any special training you might have. They want to know your criminal history, even your financial history. And depending on what kind of job you're applying for, you could have quite a few pieces of paper to fill out. Now, the reason your potential employer wants all of this is because they want to evaluate your ability, your ability to do the job. Now, going back again to conversation between Moses and God, we quickly see that this conversation doesn't have a lot of questions as a job application would have. Because, again, God was not concerned with Moses' ability. In fact, it could all be summed up in one statement. Moses, it doesn't matter who you are. It only matters who God is. It doesn't matter your ability. What only matters is God's ability. Your part in this is not your ability, but your availability. And the same thing is true today. God is not looking for your ability. He's looking for your availability. He provides what is needed. Let's look at 2 Corinthians 9, verse 8. This kind of backs this thought up. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 8. It says, and God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you always having sufficiency in all things. That echoes what we just read in Philippians 4.13, right? Having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. What does that mean? Well, it means that if you are in Christ, if you are doing the work that God has called you to do, you will not lack anything. Because God will equip you. That's why he's given you his spirit. That's why he has taught us how to pray. Prayer is that connection. 
James Montgomery Boyce tells the story of Lawrence of Arabia. It's a fascinating story. It's a good movie, but a fascinating story. It's a great part of history. But after World War I, some of Lawrence's comrades, so these Arabs from uh, these battles that he had fought in the Middle East, they came with him to visit Paris. And he showed them all of Paris, but they were, they were impressed with Paris. But what they were fascinated and most impressed with was not what was out in Paris, but what was in their hotel room, a faucet. A faucet. They would spend hours just turning it on, and water would come out. It was amazing. So when it came time to leave, Lawrence went to their room and he found, he found them in the bathroom trying to take the faucets out of the bathroom. He says, what are you doing? He says, well, you know, in our home, there's very little water. And what we need, we need faucets. Lawrence had to explain to them that in order for the faucets to work, they had to be connected to the pipeline that brought the water. Without connection, nothing's coming out of the faucet. That's the same way prayer is. You can pray all you want, and sometimes your prayer will never go further than the sound of your voice. But when you pray with connection, it changes everything. It changes everything. Again, Jesus says, this is how you pray. Our Father. Again, that just kind of blows my mind. Because now we have a new Father. A new inheritance. A new identity. A new name. Our Father is the one we pray to. And that's solely based upon a new relationship. And then the next, wo next word, who is. So our Father is to whom we pray. The word who is, or the phrase who is, is why you pray. We know that God is, and that He hears, and that He answers. That's why we pray. There's a connection. The faucet's connected to the pipeline. John says this, 1 John 5, 14, says, Now this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of Him. You pray in His will. You pray in His Spirit. And He provides everything that's needed. So just in a few words of the model prayer that we've seen so far, Jesus reveals to us that God is, and not only that God is, but He is our Father as well. And when you have faith and confidence in those two truths, then you can come before the throne of God with boldness. Look at Hebrews 4.16. We'll close here. Hebrews 4.16. Any of y'all been to the Mississippi River, maybe New Orleans, Memphis, seen the big steamboat, paddle wheel steamboats? Even like, uh, I remember we lived in Louisville, uh, you can go on the Ohio River and you see these big paddle boat steamboats still, still function. Amazing, amazing uh, uh, piece of history. But back in the heyday when paddle wheel steamboats were rolling on the river, I know you want to sing that song. When they were rolling on the river, there was a young boy on the banks of the mighty Mississippi, and he saw the steamboat chugging the way through the muddy brown river, and he began jumping up and down on the riverbank. He was screaming and shouting for the boat to come and pick him up on the shore. Now, as he was jumping and screaming at the boat, 
somebody was walking past him on the banks, and they told the little boy, he says, you know, you can, you can jump and scream and motion all you want, but that, that riverboat is not going to come to the bank and pick you up. But just then, the steamboat changed its course and started coming to where the little boy was. It got closer and closer, and the, the passerby couldn't believe what he was seeing. And finally, when the boat got to the shore, the little boy looked to the man and said, I knew that the boat would come for me because my dad is the captain. Relationship makes all the difference. Connection makes all the difference. And when you know God as your father, when you know that he is and you diligently seek him, it will change your prayer life. The rest of everything else that Jesus says, this is how you pray. If you don't have those two things first, nothing else is going to matter. Because unless you know that he is and that he's your father in that relationship with you, that's the connection. Without that, you just have a faucet with no pipes. Amen? Hebrews 4.16 says this, Therefore let us approach the throne of grace with boldness. And that word boldness is broken down into two Greek words. Uh, one is all or every, which is pas, and then reo, which means to speak or say. And what it's saying is, you can come before your father and you have openness to speak to him. You can speak anything freely. And the reason you can do this is because of your relationship with him. It's a great thing to have. Our Father, who is. Let's pray. Father, once again, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth. We thank you that you even recorded, preserved how we should pray. Father, let us not simply look at it as a recitation or a memorization, but as a guide. And may we know these two first truths completely, that you are our Father and that you are. Father, we pray for this day, we pray for this, this, this week as we celebrate. Father, may we know our true dependence is upon you, that the true King is Jesus. And we look forward to his return. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.